Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, is anyone going to RailsConf? All right, well, then you'll be able to watch the better version of this recording uh, after that. Um, but uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Um, so, all right, um, my monitor is like giant. So if you, you know, I don't need to make anything bigger, just let me know. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about uh, building progressive web applications with Ruby on Rails. Um, and uh, as Richard said, I'm Avi. Hi. Um, I started the Flatiron School uh, a long time ago. Um, I left like four years ago, uh, had another job, and then started consulting in August. Um, have two big clients. Um, got really burnt out recently trying to manage like basically two full time jobs and decided to just join. Um, one of my clients, uh, full time as the head of product, uh, Journey Clinical. Um, so I'm like in this like weird place where like for the next month and a half, I'm still working these two jobs and I'm trying to ramp up to like manage this product team. I'm just like a little burnt out and uh, did not have as much time as I wanted to go deep into this, in, into um, learning about progressive web apps. So uh, I apologize if this is a little surface um, level. Um, but yeah. Uh, has anyone, does any, everyone know what a progressive web app is? Um, they're, they're basically installable, so to speak, uh, web applications into a native OS um, that unlock uh, some of the native OS API functionality to your web app. Um, uh, you know, you've seen them like probably, uh, yeah, Andrew. I can ask this, how does this relate to like, I think Apple doesn't allow a lot of progressive web apps going in. Right. So, and like, so yeah, I was actually, I was going to add that in. Um, so, so let me tell you a little bit about progressive web apps and why they're really exciting. And then we can kind of uh, do a sidebar on the uh, drama that just went down with Apple. Um, but yeah, you know, you basically, you know, uh, can visit an app, uh, a web app, you know, in, in Chrome or in Safari on mobile or Chrome on mobile. Um, and the web app can prompt you to install itself onto your OS, whether it's iOS or OS X or Windows um, as a Chrome app. Um, but that's basically what a, a progressive web app is. Um, I remember like a while ago, uh, you know, hearing about progressive enhancement with web development. That's not what this is. Um, progressive enhancement is when, you know, you're... Um, detecting browser features and kind of upgrading what your app can do, a progressive web application goes, you know, to the extreme and says, um, you know, if installed natively, I can get access to the following APIs from the OS. Um, and uh, it unlocked a ton of functionality. You know, every browser and, and OS is a little different in terms of what's currently supported. But um, you know, you get access, especially on on, on the phone, um, you know, to a lot of really powerful APIs, right? You know, um, you know, from like uh, vibrations and shaking to some of the native like uh, text recognition and speech recognition, face detection. You know, I think the really powerful ones are the note, obviously, like push notifications, caching and background sync, payments. Like the payment API is really great. Like gives you that, you know, double click, really native, uh, na native feeling payment um, experience on a web app. So you, you can, you know, get a lot of really cool functionality. It's not universally supported, but, um, you know, hopefully over time we'll be getting, you know, more and more of these APIs will become standardized and, you know, available to, to us. Um, you know, one of the obvious questions is sort of, um, like why bother, right? Like if you want access to these APIs, just build a native app, right? Um, and th there's a pretty actually compelling from a product perspective reason for this. Um, PWAs or progressive web apps drastically outperform like mobile apps for initial usage, right? So, you know, especially if you're thinking about like, you know, running ads on Facebook or Instagram or something like that, being able to have the ad click to your web application and then prompt the user to, you know, just add it to their home screen without having to go to the app store and download the app and open it up and register. It's just, it's just a way more seamless experience. So, you know, you can think of it as getting you like, I don't want to say 
what, 75% of the um, native aspects of a mobile app without actually having any of the entropy, any of the friction, and especially, you know, maintaining two separate code bases and things like that. Um, so PWAs, you know, as, you know, like I, I was thinking there's, I think I only have one PWA on my phone and I don't even remember installing it. So while like, you know, I'm not the, the best like person to talk to from what I've read, um, th th they really perform super, super well, right? Um, there's an in fact, this entire web website that is dedicated to like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of like case studies of like exactly how well from a product perspective PWAs are, right? Can you install, um, thought, this, can you install this site as a progressive web app? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Um, I don't that think so, actually. actually. Yeah, talk there is it. actually... That screenshot I took of what can they do? There is this: uh, what can PWAs, what PWAs can do today? This is installable as a progressive web app, and it's pretty cool. Like you know, you get to play with all the like and see what they feel like. Um, in fact, let me just um, uh, screen share really quick. Um, I like being able to. Let's go on all these tangents and make this more of a discussion. It'll be a little more fun. Um, so I'm just using. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but I'm just using a mirroring app to be able to, uh, you know, mirror my phone onto my desktop for all of you. Um, and, uh, okay, cool. Let's get rid of that. And then uh, Safari. All right. Um, all right. So here is, so right now I'm on, you know, I'm in Safari. You can see the browser, right? You know, so installing the progressive web app, basically, you know, here, this is a, a pop-up. So this is a native, right? But it's telling you how to do it. On Android, this, it, it actually, the browser will actually let you just skip this step and directly install it. Um, you know, on Safari or Apple, you got to click on the share button, which is crazy. And then go to add to home screen, right? And now you've installed it as a progressive web app, right? And there you can see I have this new icon, PWA Today. And now when I open it, it opens without any of the browser Chrome, right? So that's also, what I think, gives it more of the native feel, right? Um, and we're actually going to talk about this little area above, like where, you know, uh, the, 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 the phone stats area, because um, you have to configure a lot of this. But, uh, you know, here's what I was saying on the payment one, right? Like, that's pretty awesome. Right, being able to hook into the iOS's like you know native payment processor and get that you know like double click to pay is is really good, right? Like if you're you know building like e-commerce stuff, like there's you're gonna get way higher conversion than like pulling up the Stripe, you know, fill in your credit card on a mobile phone type experience, things like that, right? Um, what were the other cool, good ones? How will, or like NFC? I think NFC. Yeah. Is so. Yeah, this isn't supported yet um, oh. on iOS, but it'd be super cool if, to be able to do that. Um, uh, let's see, any of the other really good ones? Oof. You know, like pass keys, right? You know, you get you, you get a bunch of, 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 of pretty, you know, awesome ones. And again, they're, they're gonna just keep on getting better or hopefully they'll keep on getting better. Um, but, you know, the, the to me, the big ones that I was interested in are were push notifications, you know, file storage and like offline caching and the payment one. Those were like the big things where I don't want to have to, if those are all the features I need, I don't want to have to build a whole new, a native app, especially in Android and iOS, like that, you know, being able to use a progressive web app is pretty compelling there. Um, cool. So that's a little bit about, um, I'm just going to move this off screen for a little bit. Uh, Yes, yeah, so that's kind of what got me interested in, in progressive web apps. Um, what uh, Andrew brought up um, that I meant to uh, add to this talk was this. Um, basically, you know, Apple in the EU has been, you know, fighting a whole bunch of variety of like antitrust things, right? You know, I'm sure, you know, you might have heard of the big one is Epic with um, Fortnite, basically. Um, 
And in response to getting slapped with, you know, uh, antitrust stuff, Apple basically decided that they were going to remove the ability to install progressive web apps from EU phones, right? Um, you know, we want the app store, we want the walled garden, no more progressive web apps in the EU. Every, you know, thankfully, um, the internet went up an uproar and was like, come on, Apple, this is ridiculous. And this open letter got created and, you know, thousands of people signed it. And Apple basically, from, from what it looks like right now, has reversed their decision. So they will continue allowing progressive web apps to be installed um, in, uh, in the EU. But, you know, one thing that has been sort of clear to me in, in building this and researching PWAs is that, like, you know, Apple really cares about the App Store being the only way to, inst to install apps on the iPhone and especially the only way to transact and, and collect payments. So uh, it seems as though Apple is like just in Safari are just not doing anything to really support like, you know, an open web and especially this, this technology. There is so much better support on the, for progressive web apps um, on Android which is, you know, as an iPhone user, pretty upsetting to me. Um, but yeah, I still think it's an interesting tech. I still think it's it's worth it, especially if you're not willing, if you can't just build a native app. I, I think there's a good benefit to it. Um, all right. So that's a little bit about uh, progressive web apps and, and why uh, I was super interested in them. Like from a product perspective, I just think there's a lot of really compelling use cases. So you want to build a progressive web app. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I was actually in, in researching this and, and making this this talk and, and playing with this. Uh, I, I was actually pretty, I thought this was like way more, um, I didn't realize how cutting edge or non-standardized this stuff is yet. Uh, it's actually a huge pain to develop like a, a PWA. Like you've got like eight different emulators open. They don't all behave the same. Um, so just some things that, uh, you're gonna need in order to do this. Um, one, you, uh, in order to, to be a PWA, you have to be served via HTTPS. Um, so you're gonna need a, 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 a reverse proxy like ngrok, um, you know, in order to serve your local app as uh, over uh, HTTPS. Um, but then because you're gonna end up using, you know, like emulators, right? And, you know, your, your device and your phone, the truth is that like what I found was that the, the, the thing I really needed was just what I'm developing to be accessible at a public URL, right? Like messing around with my local network settings and like is my phone and the emulator connected to my local Wi-Fi so I can use local host or my computer's IP address. It was just a nightmare. Um, so what, what I like to use um, is uh, LocalCan, which is an OSX app, but NGROC is fine. And what local can will do is basically create a reverse proxy to your local server and allow you to publish it on a public URL. Um, so, uh, you know, right here's my Rails app, it's running locally and I can go to uh, feeds-37.localcan.dev and that's actually, this is being served from my, um, you know, uh, from my development machine, right? Um, that way I can open it up on my phone if I want, I can open it up in the emulators just like as a normal URL. Kind of make sense? Awesome. Um, uh, yeah, and, and you know, if you're if you if you develop with like web hooks or anything, this you know, using having to use ngrok or a local tunnel or something like local can isn't um, uh, uh, is isn't like you know different, but uh, it was super needed for for here. Um, okay, so you're, you're gonna and then you're gonna need device emulators, right? The Android emulator. Um, you know, when you install Android Studio, you get that. Uh, Xcode gives you the iOS simulator. Um, one thing I did find is uh, while the Android emulator does a phenomenal job of mirroring like a real device, the iOS simulator does not. Like uh, it clearly, um, and I'll show you one specific one, but the iOS simulator is very aware that it is not a real phone and behaves differently. So if you're trying to like, you know, 
understand how your PWA is going to work on a real iPhone, the your the iOS simulator is going to really leave you hanging, and you're going to spend a lot of time wondering why something isn't working. Um, and the reason ends up being that it's just because it's disabled in iOS simulation mode. So what I ended up having to do is I, I got like an app called Reflect that basically uh, easily allows you to mirror your iPhone um, onto your desktop. So I don't have to like, you know, look at it when I'm doing things um, or when I'm debugging. And I found that to be just a way better developer experience. It was just to actually use a real iPhone and mirror it onto my screen than um, try to like debug the iOS simulator. Um, so those are just kind of, oh, then one other note, um, the Chrome inspector is going to be like, uh, or the, the hmm, my like, whole computer is now frozen. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, the application tab uh, on your, uh, on Chrome is going to become your best friend. Um, like, I don't really use this tab too much when I'm building like a web app, um, but as you're going to see, like, once the browser detects that you're on a PWA, like if I go here, right, it, you can see that it's registered, the service worker, and we're going to talk about what all these things are, right? And basically, you know, here you can, you, you can really get access to all the different um, APIs that are getting unlocked and debugged through there. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you've, if you've spent a lot of time in the application tab of the but it, it's really, it was like crucial. Um, and in fact, just to point out this one, uh, sometimes a service worker that you end up loading, and I'm gonna talk about what that is, gets cached. Um, this button over here saved me like hours, um, like forcing your browser to reload the service worker on reload, right? That doesn't get cached. So actually let's just, you know, with that um, uh, go on, and talk about building uh, PWAs with Ruby and Rails. Um, the, the inspiration for this talk was, uh, as I have been playing with Rails 7.1, I noticed um, that when you start a new Rails 7.1 app, you get this PWA directory in your views with two files in it, uh, your manifest.json.erb and your serviceworker.js. And then in your routes file, um, you have these two routes to serve those files, right, through Rails. And I, you know, when I saw this, I was like, oh, man, like, Rails 7.1 must have, like, some amazing functionality that makes building PWAs, like, so much easier because it seems to be bootstrapped out of the box to provide that. I have since learned that that's not true. <laughs> um, like serving a, a, a manifest and serving the service worker, you know, it was just as easy before Rails 7.1. It, it just gives you like some basic building blocks and some sane defaults um, so that out of the box, your app can mimic a PWA. But the truth is building a progressive web app has almost nothing to do with Rails and everything to do with JavaScript and, and uh, you know, the client side. Um, so, you know, it's not really, this is kind of a misnomer. You're not really building a progressive web application with Ruby on Rails. You're just building a progressive web application and Rails is your backend. There's no other helpers or magic. It's not like Hotwire and Stimulus. You know, they just have nothing to do with this, with this technology. Um, okay, so there are two key components to building a, a, a PWA. Um, the first is a file called manifest.json. Um, and this is basically uh, a manifest of settings that uh, the OS is going to use in order to both detect your application as a progressive web application and to configure um, how it looks and behaves on the OS once installed. Um, so you basically just have to, you know, in, in your application layout, just add the link tag and point it to wherever your manifest is. Again, with Rails 7.1, this route just exists and it's gonna be built to serve, um, to, to be able to, to dynamically be able to serve your manifest file. 
Um, so if you wanted to be able to like drop into Rails or your environment or anything like that, like this can be a dynamically generated um, uh, file. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just a JSON file. There's hundreds of settings that you can use that, you know, are pretty like, um, you know, specific, like from defining the icons that are going to go onto the desk, onto the OS when you install it. Um, you can have like um, loading screenshots, like, you know, when you open up a native app, like you'll, some, you get like a splash page first before the app, while the app is loading. You can do that with, with your manifest also, um, right? Uh, things like that. So you get a lot of these settings. Um, one thing I did learn is that if you don't have valid app icons, uh, the PWA will break. So basically, um, browsers will prevent your app from installing or functioning as a valid progressive web app if you don't define at least these two icon sizes. Um, I cannot believe that. I, I don't know, like, <laughs> but yeah, you just need to have icons. Um, the other important one here, I mentioned this, is the theme color. So um, let me just open up uh, Android because that's working. Um, so I'm gonna, if I install this already? All right, let's try again. Cool. All right, so here is the app. What is up here? Okay, sorry. Side. Okay, cool. So now I should be able to install this. And now in theory, there we go, right? So there it is, the installed progressive web app of my local application. And you just saw the splash page, right? When the icon just showed up. Um, so Basically, the theme color setting in your manifest tells the browser what color to use when it replaces the browser Chrome. So like up here, right? Things like that. It's like these little settings that you have to like kind of pay attention to to really create the native feeling. Um, but yeah, besides the icons, the theme color, um, you know, you can have the start page, things like that. The rest of the settings are, you know, giving you more functionality than you generally need, but there's a lot of really cool ones. Um, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Um, yeah, so that's basically your manifest. Um, Apple also has some settings that don't actually exist within the manifest. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know why, you know, again, I, I was pretty surprised. I thought there was a lot more standard support for this stuff than there is, but really every OS, like, you know, Android, even like desktop and iOS are, are, are you know, pretty different. It kind of feels like IE and Netscape and, you know, Chrome, like back in the day. Um, so your manifest is your first kind of pillar of being a PWA. And then your second one is gonna be your service worker. So a service worker is basically a background thread that is running on the OS that is running even when the app is closed, right? So the service worker that got registered when I installed this app and loaded it is still running in the background. So the service worker is basically the glue between your app and the OS even when your app isn't running, right? So through the service worker, you're gonna basically be able to connect to all the uh, native APIs you want, like the push notification service, the payment service, you know, the background sync, whatever it is you want your PWA to do, uh, your service worker is gonna be what you register that connection with and what the OS is running in the background, even when your app is closed, right? So to register your service worker, um, you know, basically I, I just put this in like my application, uh, JS, um, 
So like am I basically in the main entry point for my app's JavaScript, uh, I just register my service worker, right? You tell the browser, hey, here's a service worker. Once you do this, uh, you'll then start seeing requests every time you go to the, the web page, you know, in your server log, you will see like um, that it is serving the service worker, right? Um, yeah, so that, you know, that's basically the, what gets you a PWA, right? As I said, um, the application debugger, uh, like when I was playing with this stuff, uh, I would make changes to my service worker and then they wouldn't be reflected. And I realized the browser was sometimes caching it and things like that. Um, you know, just again, like, I mean, I found that debugging this stuff was way more tedious than I, than I thought it was going to be. Um, but you know, it's fun learning about all these things. Um, how often does the service worker refresh or what prompts that? That's a great question. Um, in theory, they don't, you can tell them to expire or unregister or deregister them explicitly, but um, I'm not sure if there's a standard, um, like in terms of when it expires or when it'll stop listening. Um, I mean, there's gotta be like, I, I imagine it's not running all the time, but um, from what I can tell, it's pretty long running. Um, and uh, I'm sure if we Googled a little bit, we can figure out like where you could set that, um, you know, to give it a timeout. And I'm sure there's a default one, but it seems to be pretty long run. Um, all right. So, um, okay. So once the service worker is registered, you're then gonna use it to basically um, turn on and turn off um, the, the, the APIs you want. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about the push, the push manager and the push notification one, but you know, this would be, uh, once the service worker has been registered and is ready, um, then you can start, you know, manipulating the, the specific APIs like payment, you know, background sync, whatever, and subscribe to them. And, uh, we're going to talk more about what this is doing, but, um, that's sort of the next step. Um, and then in your service worker what the service worker is basically going to do is um, listen for events on the services that you subscribed to, right? So I register that I want my application to, uh, sub to subscribe to the push notification service. And then my service worker says, okay, when, when the service worker or when the application gets a push event from the service worker, here's what I want you to do, right? Kind of, you know, pretty classical like event listening and things like that. Um, but yeah, that the, that's basically the general cadence, right? Your manifest defines the installation and a whole bunch of defaults. You register the service worker. The service worker um, subscribes to the features it wants and defines the events and how to respond to uh, events from those features um, is a general cadence. So let's play with um, building push notifications, um, which was really the feature I, I came for. I, I came for. Um, and it turns out it's also just not super trivial, um, but uh, it was pretty cool and, and works pretty well. So the flow of how push notifications work through PWAs is your client is going to is registers that it wants to listen for push notifications and creates a subscription object. You're going to need to take that subscription object and send it to your server and save it. And then we're going to talk about why in a second. Um, and then when your application wants to send notifications, you're going to broadcast that notification to all of your subscribers. Um, and uh, that's going to actually com well communicate with um, uh, the push notification service. Um, so in order to, um, in, in order to uh, use push notifications, um, you need basically a public and private key. Uh, I'm just going to skip ahead one slide really quick. Um, what, what I was mentioning is um, the client 
when it subscribes to the push manager, gives you back a subscription object. And the subscription object looks like this. Um, and you can see over here that the endpoint for the subscription is a Google API. Um, it's the um, uh, Firebase uh, Cloud Messenger API. Um, and if it was Apple, it would be the APN, the Apple Push Notification Service. But basically, you know, if you think about it, in order for your web server to then communicate with, you know, thousands of clients, like phones, wherever it's been installed, your server doesn't have like direct access to like a person's phone. So the way that you actually send the broadcast is not by communicating you know, your application directly to the clients, but rather your application tells Google to notify all of its, all the subscribers um, that there's a new message, right? Or your server is gonna tell Apple's notification service to notify all iPhones that are subscribed, which is why you need um, a public and private key, right? These subscription objects are encrypted between the clients your server and um, the middleman, which would at this point be, you know, Google or Apple. Um, so there's a really useful gem for all this that I discovered called Web Push. Um, I did try doing this um, without this gem, and it it just wasn't, you know, it just wasn't worth it. Um, it uh, I do want to point out though that this is the gem I'm talking about. It's Web Dash Push. Um, there is a deprecated version of this gem named uh, Web Push that will that that, that no longer works. Um, another uh, rabbit hole I wasted a whole bunch of time with, right? Um, so this gem no good. <laughs> um, this gem good, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, what I did uh, was uh, use this gem to generate a public key and a private key. And then I toss those public key and private key in my Rails application credentials. Um, and then you write the public, you have to make the public key accessible to uh, the global JavaScript object. So I just wrote it to my window. You actually don't need the base64 encode it, it turns out. You could just send it as a string. I don't know why one of the guides I read said you, you know, to do it that way, but whatever. The point is, is that um, you're going to need this public this public key in order to register the subscription correctly. Um, so your client needs to know that. Um, so once you've got your key pair um, and uh, you've made your public key accessible to the browser, um, the next step is to actually um, create the client subscription. Uh, so here is after I've registered the service worker, I'm asking the push manager to create a subscription for this client, I'm sending it, um, uh, I, I'm sending it my public key. Um, user visible only is a. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but um, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just a. It's a setting on the notification um, to say it's. Um, you intend this notification to be read by the by the user. Um, as I said, the subscription objects. So you know this method call yields you this JSON object that is the endpoint, which is a unique URL encoded between your application, your, your public key, the clients, and its public key. Um, you can say when you want this, uh, when you want this description to expire, um, and then just, you know, uh, an encryption of those keys. Um, so once the browser has created this subscription object, the next thing you need to do is basically save this subscription object somewhere, right? Because later on, like, you know, in, in my example of this, like, feed reader application, um, you know, the idea was that if one of the RSS feeds that I'm subscribed to has a new article, I want to get a push notification, of it, right? Um, so sometime in the future, my application server is like running a rake task, checking if there's new, you know, feed items. And when it finds one, it then needs to be able to say, hey, um, 
find all of the subscriptions, all the people that, that have turned on push notifications and tell them that there's a new item on their feed, right? So to do that, you know, this is basically the only Rails part, um, which is uh, the sort of chain, you know, once the subscription has been registered on the clients, then take that subscription object and just push it to your server, right? So here I'm pushing this to, you know, uh, a resource endpoint on my Rails app, push subscriptions, you know, taking a CF CFRF token um, and then sending all that as JSON, which basically allows me to, um, you know, on the controller side or on the Rails side, you know, just save that subscription object, right? Um, you know, you would want the endpoints to basically be unique um, because otherwise you're gonna, like every single time the browser loads, it's gonna create a new, a new push subscription for the exact same uh, device, but whatever. The point is, is that now in my database, I have a record of all of the clients that have subscribed to notifications and their unique endpoints that I can push a message to in order to trigger the notification, right? Um, the next step is to then uh, basically build the functionality to send a push notification payload to your subscribed clients. Um, and again, this is where the web push gem comes in super handy. Um, uh, it just basically gives you a payload send me method. The message is basically the data that uh, the client is going to get or the service worker is going to get in order to, um, well, I'll show you in a second. Um, but yeah, this basically creates an HTTP uh, payload from your server to you know Google or Apple, which then um, you know transports or, or ferries that request to the individual phones or clients that are subscribed to push notifications, right? Um, so you know, and again, this is the kind of stuff you would do like in the rake task or the background task that um, is like checking if there's new feeds or subscriptions. You know, this is where I would call that kind of stuff. Um, Awesome. So once you send one of these payloads, the next thing you need to do is um, basically have an event listener on the service worker that is listening for those events. And, you know, in this case of a push notification, it's, it's pretty, you know, common what you want to do. When the service worker receives a push notification, you want to use the service worker to basically call the, the show notification me method on the client to pop up the, you know, push notific the background push notification, right? That's the steps. Um, and with that, um, let's look at kind of how that ends up playing out. Um, cool. So I've got my Chrome emulator and um, all right. So uh, I'm in console. And as I said, like, I just have a standard Rails model called push subscription, um, which, ah, uh, which is basically just a table in my database with a JSON column called data. And here's the, here is the, the subscription, the subscription object I got from the client when the app was loaded. Um, that's 173. If I open this up again, and this is what I was saying before. Um, in theory, like there's no reason to create another subscriber um, for the same clients, but uh, the way I currently implemented it, uh, it will do that. Or it didn't. Interesting. I thought it was going to do that. All right. Um, so here's that endpoint. There's the Google API, and I think it should be this. This push subscription should be this client. So let's see if I, oh, cool. Uh, oh, I see. Um, that push subscription, I don't know if you noticed, was actually not, 
it was uh, there, there's the notification and it's coming from um, this was the, the clients when I loaded it in my browser over here uh, that was the last subscription client that uh, got registered so when I'm sending a push notification over here it's actually um, the fact that this browser tab is open is what allowed that to happen um, if I close this tab right uh, and that's the difference between a PWA and just loading my application in a browser and allowing and being allowed to send um, push notifications um, while the browser tab is open. Um, so let's go back here and um, try to think how best to make it re-register. Let's see. One seventy three. Let's give me one second. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, if I, right, there is that notification that just came in, right? Um, so this subscription object um, represents this simulator, uh, this Android sim simulator. Um, and um, Right, so the, the app isn't even open right now. And if I send another push notification, right, you know, Chrome, uh, my Android simulator got it again, right? And that's, you know, pretty awesome, right? That my web app can now, you know, via communicating with Google's, you know, push service, um, even when my website is, the browser is closed, the PWA is closed, um, I can still send push notifications to their device. Right, um, and you can see them appearing over there. Right, um, I don't know why. Like, I don't use Android, so I don't know what um, you know. Normally, you would come up on your lock screen or something, um, but I guess that's just how Android uh, treats notifications. And then similarly, um, I'm going to try to get this working. Give me one second. If I, I'm just going to try to mirror my iPhone again, my computer. This is really upsetting because I paid for this app and it's just not working at all. All right. That's the mirror app? The, the yeah, that's the mirror app. Yeah. I'm going to try one more time. Jeez, come on. This is like not even really upsetting. What kind of Mac are you using? Uh, it's like an M2 MacBook Pro. I mean, this is also obviously like, you know, as as uh, <laughs> things always are, but uh, this was all working earlier, I promise. <laughs> um, let me see. Hold on. The fire. Right, let's try oh. Let's try one more time. And it is nice to see it happen in in uh, iOS. Oh, there we go. All right, perfect. Okay, there's my iPhone. So, um, oh, I got to click there. Um, all right. So, hopefully, at this point, my iPhone registered a new subscription. It did not. So, I'm just going to reinstall the PWA. Give me one second.
All right, so reloading. Okay, so let's try this again, add to home screen, done. All right, so now, and then in order to get notifications on iOS, I just put, um, a, well, I'll tell you about this in a second because it's actually important, right? So that allows me to um, send notifications. Perfect, right? So you can see when I said allow notifications, um, the the client basically sent an Ajax request to my Rails backend, registering the subscription um, of this uh, of my iPhone to um, the push notification service, right? Which is the Apple one. And now, if I um, exit out of here, and send a notification. Right, there it is, right? Um, so let's do another one. Right, and now I got on my watch, which is useless, right? But there, um, there's the notification, right? That was able to send to an iOS device, even though the browser's not open, even though the PWA isn't open, and it kind of just works. Um, what I did mention when I like, uh, in order to get that allow notification um, in iOS to um, to pop up, what I had to do, um, basically iOS, um, in order to request notification permissions, there needs to be a user interaction, like a gesture, um, whereas uh, Android, um, Chrome, um, will allow you to basically just, you know, website loads. This website wants to send you notifications. Click allow. Apple doesn't allow you to do that. So what I did was um, basically just, and I, you know, I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but um, yeah, I basically added a, a click listener onto the entire document so that you know, if the user clicks anywhere once the PWA is installed, it will um, request permission for notification if it's not already granted. Um, if the permission is granted, it will then register, um, it, it will then subscribe to the push manager, take the subscription, send it to my Rails backend, and now this PWA is set up to receive push notifications. Um, but yeah, that is everything, I guess. You know, um, the, the service worker exposes a ton of useful events. Like, you know, you can get, you can subscribe to the before the install prompt, after install, any kind of service worker, you know, um, fetches data or receives data. Like, I mean, you can imagine the service worker is built to, you know, facilitate interacting with all those API endpoints. So like, you know, you would add an event listener, you know, for like payment and say like, okay, when the payment comes in, here's what I want my app to do and so forth. Um, and you know, what is sort of fun is that like, you're exploring all these APIs individually. Um, they all kind of behave a little differently, which is also annoying, but um, you know, that's kind of how they work. And uh yeah, I guess the thing that I discovered is um, I thought, I don't know why, but I thought this stuff was going to be way more standard and that I'd be able to find way more documentation around it. Um, it, it definitely wasn't that way. Like I had to do a lot of random debugging um, and digging to figure out like why certain things weren't working, um, uh, which I guess also means that this is sort of useful talking about this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that's everything I've said about PWA so far. And um, I guess that's it. Uh, any questions? That was really awesome. Um, oh, thanks. Really enjoyed that. I, I do have some questions. I, I'm just going to say a yeah. couple uh, and then let other people ask theirs. 
what so i guess you just answered the first question i had is what is the best resource to learn this stuff and it just sounds like did you did you have a favorite place yeah you know i was really disappointed um I, I don't have a favorite. I'm really just Googling around. It's also really tough because if you use chat GPT or, you know, AI, this stuff is basically the chat GPT has got, gets a lot of it wrong because a lot of these APIs are getting updated, you know, past its cutoff date. So it's, it wasn't even, it's not that useful. Um, yeah. the, this app itself, what PWA can do today, I was like, oh, well, no problem. I can just look at the source code of this app and get, you know, figure out how it's working and then, you know, copy all that. I could not find the source code for this application. He's got a GitHub repo for issues, but not a GitHub repo for that app, you know? That's frustrating. Which is, which is a little frustrating. Um, you know, I think the, the um, you know, MDN, um, has like a whole, and, and um, you know, uh, Chrome has a whole guide, like, you know, this is where I would basically spend more time and I'm gonna have to spend more time um, uh, uh, to go deeper into this stuff would be these guides. They seem to be cut, pretty cut, cutting edge. Um, uh, so yeah, those are the resources that I was looking at, um, but yeah. Cool. Uh, Damien, why don't you go next? Have your hand raised. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, like with the emergence of uh, WebAssembly, do you think that's going to have any impact on the landscape for progressive web applications? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess, I don't know if it, if WebAssembly is going to directly impact like PW, like PWAs, but I guess the thing, you know, like, I, like, I'm a web developer, like, I love the open web, like, I, I love open standards. Um, you know, it's the awesome thing about WebAssembly is that it just makes it, it allows your browser, you know, through open standards to be so much more powerful. Like, you know, I don't know if you've seen like the demos of like Ruby running in the browser through WebAssembly. Um, uh, one of the guys from um, uh, Evil Martians got Bundler working in WebAssembly, so you can install gems as long as they don't have native extensions in WebAssembly. Like it's really powerful. Like you know, um, I don't know if, if like PWAs in WebAssembly, you know, go hand in hand. Um, but um, yeah, like I, you know, I I am excited about being able to build more and more capable web applications and not having to rely on going native. Um, you know, Android or iOS, um, like to me, the web is the platform. Like I want to build using web standards. Um, and that was what, what was so compelling to me about being able to like play with PWAs and also just WebAssembly in general is that like the, the, the platform is getting more and more and more powerful, you know? Yeah, Yuri. Uh, this is just a random, like small technical question. So the way you're getting the the cross site token, you're just you're basically just scraping off the page. Is that like? Yeah, I'm assuming um, that's just a bit of a hack, but yeah, there's a, um, it's it's actually not, um, it's not a hack really. Um, okay, like you know, Rails embeds uh, the CSRF token in a meta tag, right? Um, you know, purposefully so that yeah. you can, if JavaScript needs it, grab it from there. Um, you know, doing it like the way I did it, like this, is super hacky. <laughs> but it, if it's a Rails app, you know, it'll always work, right? Because that meta tag is there. Um, I, you know, I, again, I was kind of rushed. I was just using the native fetch API. Um, there, Rails gives you, um, I think this is it. Yeah, so there is a, a, a simple JavaScript library that Rails gives you called request.js that will basically give you, um, uh, that gives you um, fetch methods that are built for Rails, right? So like get, post, put, patch, destroy, right? So instead of using the native fetch API, um, you know, th this is wrapping them. 
one thing that all of these wrappers automatically do is basically what I hackily did over here, right? Those wrappers will automatically uh, grab the CSRF token from the layout or from the meta tag and include it along with any request without having you to explicitly do that. Okay, cool. That's that's super neat. Uh, yeah, yeah, that just that just like stuck out to me when I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Any other questions? So you know, you do you do such great um, blog posts on Turbo and stuff like that. So just quickly, um, can you compare this to Turbo Native approach at all? Have you had a chance to do that? And will you maybe? Yeah. This available this 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 code that you've written as a as um, a big tool for us. Oh yeah, I'll push up this this repo um, and share it with the group, um, and obviously show these slides. And um, you know, I'm going to spend the next month basically in preparation for RailsConf, like going deeper into this. Like, I want to get payments working. Um, I want to see if I can get background sync working. Um, iOS doesn't support background sync, but Android does. Um, yeah, I wanted to kind of play with what other APIs uh, from the PWA library are like kind of cool to see in a web app. Like I think that payment interaction is just so awesome. Um, you know, like depending on what I was trying to accomplish with my product, I don't know if I would trust a PWA or not. Like if I was building like a shop, like a, an e-commerce store, I don't really expect people to ins download my native application just to buy something, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they would install a PWA, which then gives me access to like push notifications, you know, things like that. Um, so like I would, I, I would build a PWA given that it is for the most part, the same code base and front end as my web app. Um, yeah, I, I would probably roll out a PWA before I rolled out a Turbo Native Strata application. Um, you know, but if like my goal was to have a mobile app and just it to be powered by a Rails backend, then I would probably build a build my like Turbo Native app. Is that sort of make, like? Well, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like if I want a, a web app that plays really nice on mobile, I would go PWA. If I want a mobile app that's powered by a web backend, then I would go native. Does that sort of make sense? Like, it's what's your intention, you know? And if you, it, like, I, I, I don't know a ton about Turbo Native. I've been following Joe um, Mazzalotti a ton. He's the Turbo Native guy. Um, and, you know, I, I would go to any of his resources to, to um, learn more about like Strata and Turbo Native and things like that. So is this where you're you're focusing like your development efforts in general? Like, uh, I I'm not. I'm, can you speak to that? Like, is this your current? This is no, what you would, no, get, this is going to be your go-to. This is what I'm trying to say. Um, so you know, as I was putting this together, um, uh, I didn't actually think I had a use case for uh, a PWA at work. Um, you know, but as I mentioned, um, I'm starting at uh, Journey Clinical, which is um, a telehealth company. And, you know, for the most part, what our app is, our web app is, is a patient portal, you know, like log in, schedule a therapy session with your therapist, you know, like book a meeting with your prescriber. It's like your classic kind of like electronic health record patient portal experience. Um, there's no reason for us to build a mobile app, like a native mobile app. Um, but uh turning our web app into a pwa is not actually going to be hard and then we can prompt people to install the pwa and if they do we can then get push notifications which would be actually huge um so i didn't really think that like um i had like a, like i was just curious about the technology and also wanted to speak at railsconf and figured this would get me in um so that was sort of my um like uh, motivation for this, but um, you know, kind of seeing like what's what is pretty like doable with a little amount of effort, it would that it would be a lot of value to Journey to be able to send push notifications to patients and therapists, you know, like in advance of it, reminding them of their appointment, things like that. Um, 
so you know, I I I am gonna lobby to like put that on our product roadmap, um, but uh, otherwise, this is really just a labor of love. Like you know, again, the other motivation was I'm super into rail, like what Rails is doing with seven one, seven two, and eight. Like I think Rails is is really making huge leaps again forward after a somewhat like dark age. I think like between Rails six and Rails seven, like it really felt like a stale framework. Um, and I think, you know, in the last year, like hot wires come such a long way, turbo frames, turbo streams, like the idiot, like morphing is amazing, the view transition support. So when I saw like the inclusion of that PWA directory and not having known a lot about how PWAs work, I thought Rails was doing, was gonna be doing a lot more to support PWAs. It's basically, there's not much that a backend framework can do to support PWAs besides, you know, bootstrapping your manifest and bootstrapping your service worker. Um, so that, that was sort of my motivation was like, you know, wanting to see what Rails, what next versions of Rails were offering, and then just being really into web standards and you know, hating the walled garden of app stores. What, what, um, what option are you? Okay, I'm on Linux and Windows. I'm not using Mac for rails development and you know like i was mucking around i had to switch over to a windows machine to do some stuff and i on wsl i was creating some new web apps last night and i don't see like in the options i use i don't see that pwa directory and i'm curious like yeah your so options, it's what your your options are yeah i i so um this is so i'm just i'm writing rails edge um, I, I don't know exactly what version of 7.1 included the PWA like directory by default. Um, but you know, if we look at the my gem file, right? Um, like this app is bootstrapped off of the main branch of Rails. Okay, that's that's um, the difference. Yeah, I'll yeah, try it for the main branch. Yeah. Yeah. I figure it was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. I, I wonder if that's a precursor to maybe better support in Rails 8. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I just don't, you know, after learning a little bit more about um, PWAs, like I honestly, I don't know what else Rails can do to like support PWAs more. Um, it just seems to really be about like registering the service worker and then listening for events, you know? Like so I was trying to figure out a way to make it look like it belonged in stimulus, but it really doesn't. Yeah, so there is some speaking of this, like uh, just, I just did a quick Google says Rails 8, progressive web apps are getting first class support. I'm not sure what that means exactly. Yeah, I wasn't, I mean, again, like I, I assume now that what that means is, um, you know, the existence of those bootstrapped PWA routes and, uh, you know, files. But otherwise, like, I don't, you know, I mean, unless I, I um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, DHH, IPW tech number one objective for Rails 8. Right, so I, I'd be interested to know what else Rails could do to make playing with service workers and its events easier. Um, I don't know. Maybe just making like abstraction simpler. I, I don't know. Like some of the yeah, you know, yeah. some JavaScript code, you know, because that stuff drives me crazy. But, yeah, it drives me crazy just me. too. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, like, that that was what I was sort of hoping this to. Um, I, I was really hoping to discover like a hot wire type tech like thing for PWAs. Um, I, I didn't really expect to be spending the majority of my time in like, a, you know, a service worker file and like an app. Like I never actually like. It's very rare that I write any JavaScript in the application um, uh, JS file. <laughs> I just didn't know where else to put this. You know. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for answering all those questions. Does anyone else have questions for Avi? Well, that was just a, that was a fabulous uh, talk and really appreciate it and uh, look forward to, should we be watching your blog for the. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, on, I'll, put it on Twitter. I'll also email, you know, once I get uh, the app a little cleaned up, um, I'll send you the slides and the, the, the source code of the app so you can show it with the group. Okay. Awesome. Awesome.
All right. Thank you so much, Avi. Awesome. Really so good. Thank you guys for having me. Really great talking to all of you. Glad to see that uh, there's still some Ruby love in New York. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do this again. And Look forward uh, to that. see you at conferences or, you know, on the internet. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For anybody who wants to stick around, um, we are, you know, this is the point. Let me turn off the recording.